This is Charlotte Talks. I'm Eric Spanberg, in for Mike Collins. Today it's the local news roundup. Our panel of reporters is here to discuss the debate surrounding a near unanimous vote for the county's $2 billion budget, and they will also be digging into the Panthers huddling up in Rock Hill, plus several notable developments in the abortion debate, and I-77 is now open for toll lane business, sort of. Without, for, without further ado, our panelists, Katie Peralta from the Charlotte Observer. Good morning. Good morning. WFAE Steve Harrison. Good morning. Glenn Birkins from Q City Metro. Good morning. And he's still on your side. WBTV's Nick, Sock. Nick Oxner. I can't even say Come it. Come on, you taking the mail from Mike Collins? Yeah, I know. Uh, Nick Oxner. Is that better? <laughs> there we go. All right. Nick Oxner. We're just going to say that the rest of the show. Okay, let's start with the county budget. Before we get into the antagonism, what does this budget actually do? It raises property taxes, one. Uh, it increases the size of the county budget, I think 9%, is that right? So it's a pretty big increase. There is new money um, for just across the board. Um, I think CMS gets 50 million of the 70 million they requested. The commissioners made a, a late change to add 3 million additional, additional dollars for park and rec. There is money for affordable housing. Um, so it's a budget, I think, that really reflects this new all democratic commission. Um, and there was really very little debate on whether they're spending too much money, should taxes be lower, um, a new day. Yeah, 8-1 vote. And as you say, it is a 9-0 majority for Democrats. Steve, you also follow city government pretty closely. On Monday, they're going to vote on their budget. And Marcus Jones, the city manager, called for a revenue neutral rate. Why do you think there is the difference between raising taxes on the county side and not on the city side? I mean, I think maybe one one factor is um, the city the city council and the mayor are up for re-election this fall. So there's always a hesitancy to raise taxes in an election year. Um, but I think just the city over the past few years has been more conservative on their budget and spending than the county. Um, there's still a lot of uh, the city budgets are grow, gonna, going to grow by five percent, so there's still a lot of new stuff there. But um, there is just there has been kind of a culture shift, I think, among the two bodies. Well, and the other thing is that the county commissioners are all this is their first budget since being elected, and they all campaigned largely on here are some pet projects of mine that I want to do and increase funding for this. Whereas the city council, they were all in that honeymoon phase a year ago, right, in yeah. that budget. Um, and I think we've heard a lot of talk. From, rightly or wrongly from county commissioners uh, saying, look, we're going to come in and make investments in parks and make investments in senior services and make investments in things that our communities care about. And they feel like that's how they got elected. And so they wanted to make sure to take care of those priorities in their budget. Of course, I buried the lead here since no one expected uh, this budget to be rejected or, or even really uh, a close vote. But uh, the lone dissenting vote did come from Pat Cotham, who had previously raised questions with reporters about how this budget was managed and tweaked and whether open meetings laws were broken. So here's how George Dunlap, who's the board, who's the board chair, addressed that issue. I want you to know that this board is committed to doing what is right, doing what is fair. Um, I can tell you I've spoke with each one of them. I know what's in their heart. Um, and they're really disappointed that this had to take place. They're even uh, more so disappointed at the position that the media took without giving us an opportunity to respond. But that is not unusual for the media because they have a history of supporting uh, Pat Cotham and her antics. Pat Cotham heard those words and she responded in turn. You focused your whole talk about me I was focusing about you, the people, that you did not get to hear the discussions. You did not, I also did not get to hear the discussions. I didn't get to vote on these things. I didn't get to, I don't even know where some of these changes came from. Neither do you. That's a lack of transparency. We have fought for decades for, for access for people. And I was fighting for you. I have no regret what I did. I did the right thing. And just to finish matters off, George Dunlap had a little more to say about the media. If you read the articles, they have a tendency of labeling uh, 
primarily people of color, and they perpetuate racism, and they perpetuate stereotypes. How do they do that? Listen to the words that they use to describe leaders of color. <clears throat> if you're compassionate, you're arrogant. If you speak to the issue, then you are lashing out. Uh, this is typically how people of color are framed by the words. And words matter. Okay, so this is a 9-0 Democratic majority. How did it turn into the food fight we just heard? Well, a group of county commissioners led by the man you just heard, George Dunlap, decided to violate state law and debate the county budget over email and text message in private instead of in the public sphere. We know this because Pat Cotham's now pointed out and came forward and produced emails uh, where they were doing exactly that and additional reporting has seen that. You, you may have answered your own question. There's a, there's a popular saying that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Uh, it's never a good idea when one party uh, only controls any part of government, uh, any lever of government. Uh, we need checks and balances. Uh, I, think, uh, I think Commissioner Dunlap uh, is, is right in, in broadly speaking about the media's role, but in this, but in this particular incident, uh, he's, he's, he's wrong. This, is, this was not about race. This is about government transparency. And it's unfortunate that it became a discussion uh, about race. He, he acknowledged himself that some attorneys have said, yeah, what you did uh, violated open government laws. And it's not really, as I said last week, it's not about whether he met the letter of the law. When it comes to open government, uh, I would hope that our elected officials would err on the side of openness every time uh, and not stick to uh, some narrow definition of we met the letter of the law. Uh, we put these people in office to represent us. We, we deserve to see the process. We deserve to see how it works. It should not be conducted with private emails. It should not be conducted with emails, period. It should be done in open forum for all to see. And I let's, have, I'm well, sorry, go ahead, Nick. Well, let's address to this contention from George Dunlap that the media didn't, I mean, he said in a different part of his monologue that we didn't air that he, uh, no one from the media contacted him or the non Pat Cotham commissioners uh, before doing their story. She had spoken to WBTV, correct? Yes. The, the day this story broke uh, last Tuesday of last week, um, we, David Hodges, my colleague, investigative reporter David Hodges, did a whole interview with him. And specifically in that interview, among the things he asked uh, uh, George Dunlap was whether he would identify for the public which commissioners made which budget amendments that were in that long email motion, draft motion. Uh, he wouldn't do that. He said, go ask them yourselves. David did, and they all told him. But then he asked Dunlap specifically what amendments he made, and Dunlap wouldn't identify that. So it, he's just wrong. He's demonstrably wrong, and what he said was demonstrably untrue. And I asked him, I guess, this week about the comments about the coverage, like being, I guess, perpetu what was he said, perpetuating racism. And he walked that back a little bit, saying, no, I wasn't talking about the stories about the emails and the meeting controversy. He said, I was just talking about kind of this media overall. Because um, I think the stories, you know, I mean, they were pretty cut and dry. Um, there was really no, um, yeah, there just wasn't much to them in terms of like, racial politics and but and so he, he took that back a little bit so do we think this uh, obviously as you just mentioned Nick earlier uh, this is a new commission and they're ambitious uh, but elections come fast uh, every two years so do you think this is going to be part of the discussion in 2020 when the all nine seats are up again that's a long way away from That's now. A, I mean, yeah. Will this but, be forgotten? Well, probably. But here's the, the bigger thing is, so since this has happened, uh, again, my colleague David Hodge and I have been working with him some on this, has been trying to, to use the Public Records Act to go get emails where they're talking about this and text messages where they're talking about this. And here's why I think this will continue to be, uh, the theme will continue to be a problem for them. Because the amount of resistance that he has faced and the amount of commissioners, the number of commissioners who have been resistant to producing emails, the lack of cooperation, uh, this is the kind of stuff that I've experienced in small town government. I mean, this is what I'm essentially the same kind of behavior I'm suing the Ash County Board of Commissioners over, but that's Ash County 
population 20,000, not Mecklenburg County, where you'd think they would act a little bit more transparently. Those are the words of Nick Oxner. Of course, he has a lot of lawsuits in the works right now. Uh, we'll get back to uh, Nick's uh, <laughs> legal matters and uh, also talk about affordable housing and toll lanes and other matters. Stay with us. We're on the local news roundup here on Charlotte Talks on WFAE. You're listening to Charlotte Talks on 90.7 WFAE. I'm Marshall Terry. Support comes from WFAE members in Mazda of South Charlotte, committed to drivers that believe a car is used for more than just getting from place to place. More at MazdaofSouthCharlotte.com. And from First Citizens Digital Banking, now with Manage My Money, helping people understand what their money is doing for them and how they can do more with their money. More at firstcitizens.com, member FDIC. This is WFAE's end of fiscal year membership campaign. Our goal is simple. At the end of this month, June 30th, we want to wrap up our fiscal year healthy financially. And that has a lot to do with you listening right now. If we can hear from you with a pledge in any amount, 704-549-9000, WFAE.org. Can you afford to do $5 a month, $10 a month, maybe even $15 or $20 a month to support public radio, to support the local news roundup on Charlotte Talks? If you can, we need to hear from you. Yes, and we want to hear from you right now. Like Marshall Terry is saying, of course, you know his voice because he's on air, online, doing everything he can to give you the news on WFAE. I'm Joni Deutsch, podcast manager here overseeing FAQ City, She Says, uh, Southbound, and also our local music podcast, Amplifier. You know, all these things do come with a cost, but that cost is up to you. Do you listen for 10 hours a week? Can you donate $10 a month? Do you listen 24 hours a day, in which case we love you? But can you do $24 a month in donating? Whatever you're able to give, we're hoping that you can do it right now. And, of course, when you make a donation of $5 a month or more, you'll be able to instantly receive a $25 Lowe's digital gift card to your email in minutes. While supplies last, because, Marshall, people have been taking that opportunity to get those gift cards this morning. And we don't know how many we'll have left. So go ahead. A donation of $5 a month or more instantly receive a $25 Lowe's digital gift card as soon as we get your donation in. Supplies are not going to last. It's summer. If you've been thinking about uh, some sort of home project or maybe just messing around in your garden, there's $25 right there that you can spend at Lowe's to go toward that. 704-549-9000 is how you uh, get one of those gift cards or WFAE.org. And also uh, today, if you uh, make a contribution, you're going to automatically be entered into win a $2,000 gift card from Lowe's. You get 10 entries with a contribution to the station today. Now, to be clear, this program also broadcasts a Saturday morning. So if you are listening in the future on Saturday morning, uh, you only get six Saturday morning. So if you're listening right now on Friday, 10 entries into the raffle, Saturday morning, 6, 704-549-9000, WFAE. Dot or, of course, the uh, real reason we hope that you give is because you love Charlotte Talks. In particular, you love the local news roundup, a great way to get caught up on stories that you may have missed during the week or to go uh, deeper behind the headlines in this roundtable discussion that we do at the end of every week here on WFAE. 704-549-9000, WFAE.org. Local news roundup. You know, if you donate today, right now, then we can give you a roundup of Charlotte Talks enamel pins. They are adorable. It's a pair, a set of three, one of Mike Collins' face, one of the Charlotte Talks logo, which is really great. I love the design of it. And the third being a microphone with the WFAE uh, flag on it. Uh, $10 per month will get you that set of three enamel Charlotte Charlotte Talks pins, uh, which have been locally produced in Charlotte. And, you know, again, you can make a donation uh, of maybe $15 or $20 per month. That's just a minimum amount in order to get that gift. You can check out the full list of gifts on WFAE.org when you hit the donate button. But, of course, we're live in the studio, so go ahead and make that call. Get them right now by calling 704-549-9000. Think about all the listening you do to WFAE during the month, uh, during the week, even during the day. If you could put a price, if your dollar amount on that listening, what would it be? Can you afford to do $10 a month? Can you afford to do $7.50 a month, less than the subscri- monthly subscription to Netflix, Seven fifty a month to go towards your favorite WFAE programs? And we will send you the WFAE Queen City Crown Socks. Check those out at WFAE.org, along with all of our other thank you gifts and all of the content that we put out there for you every single day here on WFAE. And all we ask in return, a 
few times a year, we come to you like we're Joni and I are coming to you right now and ask you to simply do what you can to support public radio. When you give and your neighbor gives and your friends give, all of that money comes together. We turn it into great WFAE programming like Charlotte Talks, like news reports that you hear on Morning Edition or on All Things Considered. News reports as part of our uh, 2019 series looking at the affordable housing crisis in Charlotte, finding home. That's where your dollars go. 704-549-9000, WFAE.com. Back on Charlotte Talks, I'm Eric Spanberg, in for Mike Collins, and we are on the local news roundup. Our panel today includes Nick Oxner of WBTV, Glenn Birkins from Q City Metro, Katie Peralta from the Charlotte Observer, and Steve Harrison from WFAE. Uh, we were talking about the county budget, and one of the components of that budget is $15 million more for affordable housing. And also this week we had news on the effort to match the city's $50 million funding by the private sector. Where do we stand there, Glenn? We are closing in, uh, or they are closing in. The uh, Charlotte Housing Opportunity Investment Fund was created uh, by the Foundation of the Car for the Carolinas to raise $50 million from the private sector. This week, uh, both Atrium and Fifth Third Bank announced that each would give $10 million uh, broadly speaking, to uh, affordable housing. All $10 million from Atrium will go into that fund. Uh, of the $10 million from, uh, from Fifth Third Bank, $3 million will go into that fund, and the other $7 million will go into loan initiatives and plan investments, whatever those are. Uh, so this takes the fund uh, up to, I think, about $44 million of that $50 million goal. So they're, they're at 88 percent, and one of the things that Michael Marsicano from the Foundation for the Carolinas pointed out is that when you add up the, the government investments, you add up uh, this new private housing fund and other donations such as land and uh, lower interest rates uh, from the banks for building affordable housing, they've generated $220 million worth of commitments in the past year. They were at $15 million, one five, $15 million before that. So I guess my question for you, Steve, would be, with the 34,000 unit deficit, what kind of optimism do you sense on the political side in terms of making a significant dent in this problem? I mean, you know, I think the big problem is that, what, 65 people move to the city now every day, 60, something like that. So it is a, um, I don't think there's ever gonna be a moment in five years or 10 years where there'll be a press conference and say, we're done, uh, mission accomplished. Um, I mean, one thing I think is interesting about this fund and the money they've raised is it seems almost like a throwback to before the recession when the big banks and the big corporate players gave so much money and could be leaned on to support so many initiatives. And then after 2008, that really kind of went away for a long time. And, and it seems like with the housing fund, um, everyone's back. Everyone I, is really willing to pitch in. And they're at like every single big name of a corporation in that bucket. It's almost like there's peer, peer pressure or something to kind of uh, pitch in, make your voice heard. I, I am aware that they're not doing it for vanity purposes, but it does look good. Um, and I think it's it's something to brag about, honestly. Like it's, it's a good look for them uh, as they recruit talent. Um, as they talk about their involvement, involvement in the community, et cetera. That old peer pressure. Yeah. Going back to what uh, Steve was saying about the private sector really stepping up big in a, in a new way since the recession, I think two things probably contribute to that. One, obviously, is the, is the uh, study that ranked Charlotte last in economic mobility. That was a huge embarrassment to the city. Uh, and the other was, frankly, the uh, Keith Scott uh, shooting Absolutely. And, the, and, the, and, the, uh, and the protest that followed. And I think those things are uh, related. Uh, I think uh, the private sector is re-energized, was re-energized by those two uh, things to kind of step forward and to be more uh, uh, visible in trying to uplift some seg segments of this uh, population that has been ignored. Now to switch topics to something that has been smooth the entire way through, we've opened 15 miles of the I-77 toll lanes. Well, we have only 11 to go, Nick. Now, just calm yourself. Saturday, people were able to get on the road and pay to drive 15 miles. So how's that working? 
<laughs> About as well as you might expect. <laughs> <laughs> was as effortless and flawless as that transition into this. That's right. <laughs> Look, so it's the northern portion of the toll lanes that have opened. Um, they opened over the last weekend. This has been the first full week people have been able to drive on them. Um, I think it, one week is not enough to know what the usage is going to be like, but we certainly know there was a, the same people who have been critical of the lanes far before ground was ever broken continue to be critical. I think they're – continue to be concerned and question about how people, for instance, are going to exit these mm-hmm. lanes to get off on exits on the interstate. Um, how much are they going to cost? Because, remember, there's this dynamic pricing on the lanes. Um, and, again, week one is, of half of them is great. Uh, they kind of opened, I don't want to say unexpectedly, but it's kind of like, hey, by the way, these lanes are going to open up. It's like a flash sale. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, and so – it is a milestone. I don't know if it's a good one or a bad one, but here we are. <laughs> and I, I think it's supposed to be finished, fully finished in the fall. Uh, so this is a $670 million project, obviously uh, a private project, and that's generated a lot of scrutiny. Steve, I know you've been in a lot of these meetings in terms of trying to change the contract. What, what's the likelihood that something meaningful is going to be changed? I, I mean, it doesn't seem really high. The uh, uh, to do any kind of, to change the contract at all, to give more capacity for free traffic, um, they'll have to pay the private developer compensation because they'll lose toll revenue. And um, I think WFAE had a story this week kind of talking about where that stands because the state had talked about, well, maybe we'll use the shoulders uh, during rush hour to let more people go ride for free. And... um, uh, Centra, the company that built them, said, well, we haven't really talked about that. So there just doesn't seem to be a whole lot of movement. Um, I think that traffic will flow better initially. It's going to help. But it, as the skeptics say correctly, that this is a 50-year contract. And so what's going to happen in 5, 10, 15, 20 years when there's no new free capacity added and so many people keep moving to Lake Norman? Well, here's the thing, though. It's a 50-year contract, but Centra and every other project it had done – when it, this, in February of 2017, I went to three central owned toll roads, one in Texas, one in Chicago, one in Indiana. That they all, one was one they had built, the other two are ones they'd bought. Uh, at this point, all three of those that I visited have gone bankrupt because Centra's business model just didn't work. And so Centra has a history of doing these projects where they get financing based on projected revenue and projected ridership, and then it doesn't meet it. And then they keep raising the rates to try to you know, supplement their revenue, and then even fewer people ride it. And so uh, in all of those cases, Centra no longer operates and owns any of the all three of those roads so that will definitely be something to watch uh, several notable abortion stories in charlotte and north carolina this week i want to start with the general assembly where the republican majority house failed to override governor cooper's veto of the born alive bill uh, here's a sample of the debate uh, from republican gregory murphy he's the only doctor in the legislature here's what he said to his colleagues about the bill why would you vote against my colleagues rendering, being forced to render aid to that child, even if it's just palliation. I mean, please don't make this the issue that it's not. It is not about abortion rights. It's about right for existence. And on the other side of that argument, New Hanover Democrat Deborah Butler criticized her Republican colleagues for what she said was an attempt to legislate a knee-jerk reaction. It seems that it is more important somehow to intentionally inflame people and to gin up voter outrage, to take a page out of some national playbook to undermine women's access to health care, than it is to really take time to evaluate what the actual effects of this bill will have on our North Carolina families. So, Nick, I I think this is one of the most direct results of what happened in November, breaking the supermajority. How likely is this to stand as is? The the bill the the veto yeah yeah oh this was the final vote here right I mean will they try and bring this up at some point in the future or do you think this 
is no, you know, I think this is, and, and that might be a good thing. That might be if you're a Republican, right? That might be what you're looking for. If you're a Democrat, this is also a victory because you can say, look, this is what happens when you don't have a Republican supermajority. If you're a Republican, you say, look, these you know menacing Democrats are. This is a a a, a one of the someone referred to it as the Trinity of the Republican Party, right? On social issues, um, you know, and so this is so the debate around this legislation though has broken down along party lines and ideological lines of Republicans saying, look, this isn't about limiting access to abortion. It's about taking care of children after a a failed abortion. Um, Democrats saying this is an attempt, an affront to try to restrict abortion-related things. Or, and, uh, you've also heard that this is unnecessary because doctors already care for children when, after they're born. And it's already against the law. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and so depending on the you know, party affiliation of whoever you're talking to, it either is or isn't. And we got into this debate of uh, looking for st- statistics to quantify this. It didn't seem – there aren't many statistics that really give you a sense of – whether this is a large problem or not. And, 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 you know, which is why here you have an issue that's kind of nebulous. It's related to a hot button social issue, right? It, it's going to, you know, this is going to be a vote that turns out in campaign ads and mailers yep. a, a year from now. Yeah. On and, both sides. And at the same time, obviously, this is all against the backdrop of Roe v. Wade and what happens with the Supreme Court and the laws that have been passed in Georgia and Missouri and Kentucky and Alabama. Uh, and the Washington Post this week spotlighted Charlotte because of a new Planned Parenthood clinic that is opening next month. And I thought the most interesting part about that story was how Crandall Bowles and others involved in this effort uh, basically made it a stealth operation. And so I guess that's kind of the approach people feel they need to take now because of all of the abortion controversy? They seem to have an idea, probably rightfully so, that this would um, attract a lot of media attention and um, scrutiny um, if it became public that they were um, undertaking this ambitious fundraising effort. Um, $10 million, I believe, is what they ended up um, Mm -hmm. paying for it, and it's been in the works for years. Um, One thing that it's fascinating is that this is opening right now. It seems like it was planned this way, but of course it was not. Um, This is opening at a time when, um, you know, there are, I think, half of states around the, half of all U.S. states have passed or considered some sort of law kind of quote unquote chipping away at Roe v. Wade or, you know, chipping away at abortion access. Um, You know, this is the fourth clinic, I believe, in Charlotte that will um, provide some sort of uh, women's health related service. Um, abortion though has not been provided in Charlotte Planned Parenthood since I believe the late eighties, yeah. early nineties. Um, so that's something that's, I, I would assume maybe a misconception or not well known. Um, and furthermore, abortion constitutes a very small percentage of that's all. the number that jumped out at me, Katie, 3.4% nationally at Planned Parenthood clinics. Right. And you know, nearly half of the patients who come into these clinics don't have health insurance. So they're coming in for things completely unrelated to abortion. I mean, um, sort of preventive care type um, type things, you know, breast exams, um, other tests that um, really are uh, pretty necessary for women's health. So you have those two stories and then yet another abortion-related story, which was city council uh, discussed this week a possible sound buffer, I think 200 feet around schools, churches, and medical facilities. Uh, Republican Councilman Ed Drigg says this might be an action that's simply aimed, aimed at, at curbing the anti-abortion protests at the clinic on Latrobe Drive. Here's what he said. I believe that the situation at Latrobe is not good, okay? I, I think we agree on that. It's, it, it's uh, intrusive. It, it causes distress. It could be dangerous. But on the other hand, I think the way we're going about trying to deal with it is less than completely transparent. And I don't believe that two wrongs make a right. So, Steve, they're going to vote, I think, June 24th. That's right. What do you think happens with this? I think it passes. Um, And, I mean, Commissioner Driggs is right in a way that this is kind of an overall umbrella change to the noise ordinance when it includes includes schools and other things. But this is really about the clinic on Latrobe Drive where there's been really intense protests for years now. Um, And uh, people at the clinic and supporters of abortion rights have complained that the protests are hostile, intimidating women. Um, Of course, the other side says you're uh, 
this is our First Amendment right. And so that's what this is about, is to create a buffer uh, to try and lower the volume. And I assume this is going to pass later this month. And there were a number of anti-abortion uh, people there who are angry, but they were not able to speak, at least at that meeting, correct? That's right, because it was just a, uh, it was a, uh, you know, what's, I guess what we used to call the dinner meeting at city council, where there's no official public comment. So what they weren't able to speak wasn't kind of particular to this issue. That was just kind of a standard thing. There, when, when the issue, when the ordinance is voted on later this month, uh, that's there was, will be that's plenty of opportunity okay. to... We will have the public airing, so to speak? Yes. Okay. I assume many, 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 many speakers. I would have been really curious to hear what he would have suggested. He said that two wrongs don't make a right and that this was not the way to address it. I don't know if he proposed what he felt would be the way to address that. No, we, I mean, we'll, we'll pick that up right after the break. Stay with us. You're listening to the Local News Roundup here on Charlotte Talks on WFAE. It comes from WFAE members and the British International School of Charlotte, recognizing the talents of all learners from 18 months to 18 years with a personalized international education and the IB Diploma Program, BISCharlotte.org. And from the Whitewater Center, which provides year-round opportunities and access to the active outdoor lifestyle through yoga, zip lines, festivals, and instruction, more at usnwc.org. I'm Marshall Terry. This is our end-of-fiscal year membership campaign. We'd love to hear from you right now at 704-549-9000 or wfae.org with a contribution in any amount if you are a fan of Charlotte Talks. We need your support to bring it to you in the months ahead. I'm Marshall Terry. Joni Deutsch, our podcast manager here at WFAE, is in the studio with me. Hey, Joni. Hello. And yes, podcasting is becoming a thing now at WFAE. In the last year, we've launched four different podcasts. She Says with Sarah D'Elia, which uh, has been winning awards left and right. Southbound with the acclaimed journalist Tommy Tomlinson, who you know and love from his commentaries or commentaries on Monday mornings. Uh, FAQ City with Nick Delacanal and also Amplifier, the music podcast about the Charlotte scene that I host, all of which is made possible with your support. Likewise, for Charlotte Talks when it's on air and then online as a podcast. Whether you donate a little or a lot, just know that your donations do make WFAE possible every day of the week. That's why we're asking for your support right now, this day of our on-air membership campaign. We hope that you take one minute of your day to give us a call, just like Janice did in Charlotte, just like Larry did, uh, him and his dog, in fact, joining us, uh, and Mahmood as well, and Matthew's Go ahead and give us a dial, 704-549-9000, because Marshall, when they make that donation in any amount, they can be entered 10 entries on Friday or six entries on Saturday into our Lowe's gift card raffle. $2,000, Marshall. $2,000, a $2,000 gift card to Lowe's could be yours. Think of all the uh, summer projects you could do around your house with $2,000 worth of uh, products from Lowe's. 704-549-9000, WFAE.org. As Joni said, a gift in any amount will get you entered to win that 10 times today. If you're listening to this program on Saturday, uh, you have six entries if we hear from you on Saturday. Also, something else related to Lowe's that we are doing right now, this end of year, end of fiscal year membership campaign while supplies last. If you make a do donation of $5 a month or more, you'll instantly receive a $25 Lowe's gift card that will be sent to you digitally. Now, again, that's $5 a month or more. $25 gift card uh, would be yours. That's not a raffle. That's what you will receive mm -hmm. while supplies last. And believe me, they are going fast. So if you want to get in on that, we need to hear from you. If you've been thinking uh, for a while now, I've been really meaning to give to WFAE to join the station as a listening listener member. Now's a great time. Get that $25 gift card if you can afford to do $5 a month or $10 a month to put toward Charlotte Talks. Let's hear from you. 704-549-9000 or WFAE.org. You know, a lot of listeners have told us during this on-air membership campaign that they tune to WFAE because they can't find these stories, these perspectives anywhere else. It's why they love listening to Amplifier because Charlotte music typically isn't given a spotlight on a national level. We do it here at WFAE. Likewise for the local news roundup. Where else can you find Charlotte news with these esteemed journalists? You can't. You can't find them anywhere else. It's why we're asking for your support. We only do this a couple times on the year, getting on the air, asking for you to call in 704-549-9000, WFAE.org. We're not asking you to fund a year's worth of the roundups, you know, thousands of dollars. 
we are just, although if you want to do that, that would be great. Feel free. We are just asking you to do your part. $5 a month, $10 a month. If you can be slightly more generous at $20 a month as a sustaining member of WFAE, you're not only going to get that $25 Lowe's gift card sent to you digitally. We'll also say thank you by sending, sending you the Public Radio Nerd t-shirt if you'd like it, $20 a month. We are going back to the conversation on the Roundup. The phone, you, uh, we, you won't be hearing Joni or, or me. The phone lines are still open. Mm-hmm. 704-549-9000, WFAE.org. Back on Charlotte Talks, I'm Eric Spanberg, and this is the Local News Roundup. Joining me today are Nick Oxner from WBTV, Glenn Birkins from Q-City Metro, Katie Peralta from the Charlotte Observer, and Steve Harrison from WFAE. Glenn, I cut you off there at the, at the end of that segment. Pick up your thought if you don't well, mind. Well, what I was asking uh, uh, Steve was, uh, at that council meeting, uh, Driggs, I believe it was, did he propose solutions? He acknowledged that what's happening on uh, Latrobe is problematic. Uh, did he did he propose something other than this noise noise ordinance? Right. I didn't hear a I didn't hear kind of a proposal from him as to how to deal with this issue. And so, um, you know, I think in in a sense he's right that the reason for this ordinance or the change in the ordinance is because of Latrobe Drive, but. That often happens in government where you've got – and you – so, yeah, I'm not sure – I'm not sure if you feel like something needs to be done, I don't know what the answer is. And I didn't really hear one, an alternative at council on Monday night. Well, and the interesting question will uh, – that, well, I'm sure we'll see uh, sooner rather than later is whether or not the courts uphold – this iteration of a noise ordinance, of course, they've been challenged in circuit, federal circuit courts across the country elsewhere, but not at the Fourth Circuit. So and we know that there's been litigation over this exact issue previously and previous efforts to try to, to stem or curb the uh, protests outside the Latrobe Drive Clinic. Um, surely this one will end up there, too, if, and when it passes, and it may end up making some case law at the Fourth Circuit. So to make a, uh, a very uh, rough transition on a much different note, Carolina Panthers owner David Tepper, <laughs> steady yourselves, Carolina Panthers owner David Tepper, who is from Pittsburgh, tried out his southern accent this week in Rock Hill. This is going to be a showcase down here and going to bring people down to this region and we'll have, you know, you know just a, a sense of excellence, not only up there for the football team, but everything we do down here in Rock Hill, South Carolina. So, Katie Peralta, what is it about Rock Hill that has David Tepper putting on a shrimp and grits act? Remember uh, at the owners' meeting in NFL, at the NFL owners' meeting in Atlanta last year, when he said he was going to celebrate by enjoying some pork rinds or something. Yes. It was one of yes. those yes. bless your heart moments. Right. <laughs> um, so this was sort of an annex, as expected um, ceremonial type uh, thing this week. Um, you know, Rock Hill is. Um, or was long anticipated to be the you know new home of the of the Carolina Panthers campus. It'll house a medical facility. It'll house the corporate offices. It'll house uh, the practice fields eventually. Um, you know they could move uh, training camp there eventually. I think that's something that probably will happen. Um, and I, I believe that they're expected to move there by 2022. Um, so this, you know, this comes thanks to $115 million in incentives from the state of South Carolina um, that will come in the form of tax breaks, essentially. Um, but, you know, it, it signifies that the, the team is kind of spreading its geographical reach a little bit. Um, it will maintain its stadium presence here in Uptown Charlotte. Um, what happens around the stadium and within the stadium in terms of renovation is sort of uh, – Yet to be determined. I think they'll probably set their sight on uh, that development next, since they have the South Carolina thing, um, you know, inked. Um, but this was this was more or less a ceremonial signing. It was it was very much expected that they would go through with this. Um, there was a little bit of backlash um, early on, I, I guess, in the legislature, um, just regarding like the actual economic impact, whether it might have been over. Um, overinflated, but at the end of the day, uh, South Carolina embraced this team with open arms. We were talking before the show about uh, whether or not this uh, this new complex in South Carolina could actually be the kind of the camel's nose under the tent and eventually lead to the uh, stadium going to South Carolina. We know that there is no plan currently to do that. How how solid is that is that commitment uh, and could that could that threat still be used to to extort or or to extract 
more money from from the city? I absolutely think it could be a bargaining tool, um, and that's something that I and you, Eric, have reported on. And it's it's not a definite thing, but you know they've also. Um, pointed to the fact that this is one of the oldest stadiums in the NFL. Um, they, they're they fighting their uh, county revaluation right now, which is something that Steve has reported on, too. I think the county uh, pegs its new value at something like $534 million. Um, I've heard that compared, you know, I've heard stadiums compared to, like, old cars. You know, even if you get, you know, a, a new, uh, you know, fancy new paint job, it doesn't automatically increase the value of your car by $5,000 or whatever. So the stadium is decreasing in value, and it's an aging asset that shouldn't be, you know, this half a billion dollar thing, as the county says it is, is what the team is saying. Um, so, sorry, long way of saying that um, I think that there are ways that they could bargain with the city um, to you know, get more financial assistance in undergoing stadium renovations, in uh, kicking off some development plans around the stadium. Um, you know, it's a it's a classic North Carolina versus South Carolina thing, and I think that probably um, you know everybody everybody looks for uh, tax breaks from the city uh, in, in the NFL and other pro sports teams. So I wouldn't expect any any different from this one. I mean, the thing that just struck me about it is. The city of Charlotte in the state of North Carolina just completely took a pass. Like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not even going to fool with that because i got to worry about a stadium. That was at least how I interpreted it. it. I mean, it's tough because that's not how they do incentives here. Like, you can't right. throw incentives at an organization that's already here just to keep them here. That's that's not how incentives work. Um, you, you know, if they said... Although Avid Exchange, Lending Tree, I mean, those are a little bit different because you're adding jobs. Right. And that's what they couldn't do. Exactly. Had the team said something like you know, we're going to add 100 new corporate employees. Is there anything that, you know, North Carolina or the city of Charlotte could do to sweeten the pot for us a little bit? I think that would have changed the equation a little bit. Um, but, I, you know, it was a tough situation. I, th I think it was kind of strange how they sort of didn't put up a fight. Although um, something tells me that had, they ser had someone seriously gone to Raleigh and said, if you give us an incentives, we would do this. I mean, we've heard Republican leadership in the General Assembly say that they want to make sure the team, really, I think they're talking about the stadium, stays here. We've heard Governor Cooper say that he wants to make sure the Panthers have their you know, home in Charlotte still. Um, so something tells me, had he really gone asking for it seriously, they would have found a way. I mean, look at what they did for when Apple was considering yeah. bringing a sizable presence here. That's a good point. And going back one more thing with the, with the property tax, tax issue Katie talked about, back in 2013 when... Um, during the old negotiations when Jerry Richardson was the owner, the Panthers really wanted to not pay property taxes on the stadium. A lot of NFL teams, even those that own their own stadium, don't pay taxes. That was a big deal for the Panthers. Um, the city, I think at the time, realized the optics that would be terrible and insisted they still have to pay. But, but yeah, I think this time there's going to, you know, you could create some kind of ordinance or not ordinance, but some kind of regulation, you know, ability to refund them their money and I assume that will that's going to come up they also year. got the bill passed I think it was last year um in the state where they don't have to pay yes that's right right like because they don't own their land they argue that they shouldn't have to pay yeah. taxes on the land or they pay they rent it for a dollar a right. year or something like right. that yeah um so that's saving them several hundred thousand dollars a year um but the, the revaluation thing I think is going to be probably something we need to watch very closely um that's a way that the city and county could work with the panthers um you know work with them quote unquote to to make uh, uptown charlotte a, a more financially viable place for them to be in their eyes you have to look out for david tepper he's only worth 12 billion dollars um nick i want to ask you a little bit about this story we've talked a lot on this show in the past year or so about 287g and immigration and of course Gary McFadden ran on uh, not participating in 287G as Charlotte Sheriff. He has made good on that. Uh, this week, a related issue led to some words between uh, Sheriff McFadden and uh, U.S. Attorney Andrew Murray, who was the former district attorney here. What uh, are they uh, upset about? <coughs> Excuse me. So in essence, um, there was a suspect two last week, two weeks ago, 
uh, who was arrested in Charlotte by CMPD after a nine-hour standoff with uh, SWAT officers, uh, arrested and charged with a number of felonies related to um, domestic abuse, domestic violence. This was the second time in about two weeks that suspect had been uh, arrested by CMPD and charged with domestic violence-related crimes. Um, he'd bonded out of jail the first time. He was back on the street after this nine-hour standoff, charge again a second time. Um, so he was released from jail uh, over the weekend from the Mecklenburg County Jail this past weekend. Uh, he made bond, and he was released. Well, this week, the U.S. attorney came out and had some criticism for the sheriff because this suspect is alleged to be in the country illegally. And the U.S. attorney says had an ICE detainer placed on him. Uh, of course, Sheriff Gary McFadden has said we will not honor ICE detainers. Now, that's different than participating I was gonna say, in that's 287G, different. and that's an issue here in this discussion that has gotten very muddied, right? But um, ICE detainers are a thing where Immigration and Customs Enforcement says, hey, you have a guy that we want to arrest. Please don't release him yet, even if he makes bond. Uh, it's, you can decide to pick and choose which ones you honor. It's not a warrant. It's not an arrest warrant, but it's a, hey, please hold this guy for us. Um, so when, when Gary McFadden ended Mecklenburg County Sheriff's Office's participation in 287G, he also said we'll no longer honor any ICE detainers. Well, this week on Tuesday, uh, U.S. Attorney Andrew Murray came out uh, and in an interview said, look, you have a, a, a demonstrably bad dude who's been arrested multiple times for violent offenses. You had a tool in your toolbox, that's what one way he called it, to keep him behind bars and you didn't use it because you're not going to do anything to cooperate with ICE. Uh, and he told me in an interview on Tuesday that the sheriff is making the community less safe by refusing to, to work with ICE at all. Uh, the sheriff came out, came back and said, look, I didn't make the rules. You know, I didn't Th make this your... is a federal problem. Is yeah, basically what that, said, that, right? that, that, yeah, not my problem. I mean, clean, I think those clean up your that, legislation. You figure right. it out. I'm doing my job. That's right. There's another there's another piece of this puzzle. Uh, Nick, you mentioned that he's bailed out twice uh, after after these offenses. Do we know wh how high that bail was? I didn't check to look, but I totally agree with you, right, is is that is an unspoken part of this, is who was the magistrate that set a bond in an amount that is attainable, right? It probably couldn't have been that high um, on the second time where you have – even the first time, but second, you know, the second time he was able to make bond, uh, and that's a, a, a question I think for the magistrate's office. Absolutely, and this isn't just a this isn't just an issue for the sheriff's sheriff's office. Uh, I think you have to look at that part of it as well. And I asked uh, Andrew Murray didn't make it into my piece, but I asked him in our interview about that. Like, do you put any of the fault on the magistrate's office? And he wouldn't go there. He said the court system looks and does what they feel is appropriate. Um, but but we know, and I've done reporting on this before. Maybe you've looked at this previously as well, that, that the magistrate's office is trying to move away from money, bo money bail and, and is taking a stance and has gotten some criticism from some of the community uh, for giving less, less than they could amounts, bail amounts to violent uh, people charged with violent crimes. So I want to sneak one more story in here before we go, which is very important because it involves brownies and coffee. So, Katie, you reported this week the original Amelie's may be on the move. Uh, why are they looking at possibly moving? There's some uh, legal strife with the owners of the property, and um, they essentially have put up for sale kind of a, a couple of parcels on the property where Amelie sits. Um, I think two kind of adjacent to the building itself. Um, and one of the owners wants to sell the building, too. Um, and the tenants inside are – I've talked to a couple who have said that they are – either getting out, they are out, or they will be, um, you know, considering leaving. Um, Amelie's has said that it wants to remain in the Noda area, um, but it's it's looking like they probably will be moving um, at some point soon. So hopefully we should have a new location to announce um, before too long. Very good. Katie Peralta of the Charlotte Observer gets the last word. I want to thank Steve Harrison from WFAE, Glenn Birkins from Q City Metro, Nick Oxner from WBTV. You've been listening to the Local News Roundup. I'm Eric Spanberg, in for Mike, Mike Collins. Thanks for listening to Charlotte Talks on WFAE.